Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are desperate for you and we are hungry for you and we long to see you in your word and feed upon you as the living bread and drink from you as the living water and I ask that you would come now and help me with this difficult and controversial and yet precious and needful topic so that Christ is exalted in what I say and in how we respond as a church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good, solid, Bible-believing Christians disagree about the meaning of the biblical gift of prophecy, which is what we're going to talk about today. Even those who hold a very high view of Scripture, that it's inspired and inerrant, and even those who hold to a full-orbed, reformed, biblical vision of God, as we do, can disagree on the meaning of the gift of prophecy. For example, Wayne Grudem, in this book, the gift of prophecy in the New Testament in today has a different cover now than when I bought it, argues that there is one view of prophecy, and uh, I think a former teacher of his, a professor at Westminster, Richard Gaffin, in this book, Perspectives on Pentecost, holds a different view of prophecy. So you got one view there and one view there, and uh, those two men would agree with 98% of what we love in this church about God. So that's the kind of situation we have when we come to the spiritual gifts, especially, especially the gift of, of prophecy. So we want to tackle what it is. First of all, let me clear up something out of the way immediately. In your head, probably, is the equation prophecy equals prediction. Get that out of your head. Old Testament and New Testament prophecy was way more than telling the future. When you read the prophets like Jeremiah, Isaiah, they morally indicted the people. They called them to repentance. They predicted both judgment and mercy. It was a full-orbed forth-telling as well as foretelling. Now let's take Gaffin and Grudem. Gaffin's understanding of New Testament prophecy is that New Testament prophecy was completely authoritative, divine, inerrant, inspired, and on a par with apostolic scripture writing. And therefore, it no longer exists in the church today. When you read in chapter 12, verse 6 of Romans, that there is this gift of prophecy to be used in proportion to your faith, that's no longer relevant for the church for our experience. That happened then as prophets spoke with divine authority provided a foundation for the church. We stand on that and move forward, and that no longer is valid. So we shouldn't even try to appropriate this thing called prophecy for our day. It causes endless problems if we do, Gaffin says. If, if prophecy, he would say, in the New Testament sense is valid today, the New Testament the Bible should be getting bigger and bigger and bigger with every new prophetic word that comes out of a prophet's mouth. And that's what's in danger is the, the Scriptures, he would argue. Grudem, on the other hand, argues that New Testament prophecy is not inspired in the same way that the Scripture is inspired. It is not inerrant. It is fallible. 
It is a human, fallible report of something God has spontaneously brought to mind that you wouldn't know otherwise, and it is different from teaching in that teaching is based on a written text, and prophecy isn't based on a written text, but some spontaneous thought that comes into your head that you are then reporting to somebody else for their encouragement or conviction or consolation. I'll give you some examples of what Grudem means by it. You're having a prayer meeting or a small group meeting, and somebody says, I have this strong sense, well, they, they could say it in a lot of ways, some dangerous ways and some careful ways. That's one careful way. I have a strong sense that our sister church in Guinea is spiritually struggling right now and is much in need of our prayers. So you give yourself to prayer in an unusual way, and you get an email the next day that there was a crisis and God came through. What's that? So that's what I mean by the gift of prophecy. Or from Charles Spurgeon, the London preacher in the uh, 19th century, two experiences reported in his autobiography. He's preaching. He looks up to the balcony, about 3,000 people. Young man, the gloves in your pocket are not paid for. Out, out of the blue, and, and the young man penitently comes forward at the end, stunned that God had fingered him, because that was true. Or in another situation, he says, there is a man sitting here who is a shoemaker. He keeps his shop open on Sundays. It was open last Sunday morning. He took nine pence, and there was a four-pence profit on it. His soul is sold to Satan for a four-pence. That's Charles Spurgeon, a Calvinist, talking like a wild-eyed charismatic. And that came true. Or take last Sunday, for example. See what you make of this. I'm not sure what I said Sunday evening. I use illustrations differently from service to service. And, uh, but in the morning, I'm standing here and I'm preaching and I say, it is not acts of mercy. It is not ministry of mercy to have a Bible study with well-to-do businessmen on the 36th floor of the IDS tower. Now, that's not in my manuscript. That came out of nowhere, this 36th floor. And uh, a woman comes up to me at the end of the service with radiance in her face and says, I'm a visitor today, and I had a meeting on the 36th floor of the IDS Tower with some well-to-do businessmen this week about a ministry venture that I'm not sure I should be engaged in, and I came to this church hoping for some guidance and encouragement this morning. What do you make of that? Now, there are all kinds of ways, there are all kinds of ways that you can explain that away. Just coincidence. And of course it could be a coincidence. Absolutely it could be a coincidence. But it may not be, and if we pray, which I do uh, before each message, that God would come and work in me, not just with, with this, which I worked on hard and believe there's edifying, life-changing insight here if the Holy Spirit would bless it, but with whatever else He is pleased to do in this brain while I'm preaching as I'm looking out on human beings that need things that may not be here. Wayne Grudem would call that the gift of prophecy. So now I've already tipped my hand that I think Wayne is, is right in the way he understands the gift of prophecy, and I want to look at some New Testament evidence for it. So that's, that's what I'm going to offer to you as the way we should think about it and uh, the way we should use it. And I'll try to give some real practical guidance when we're toward the end as to how, how did, what do you mean? What, what are you supposed to do with this? 
Pastor John. So here's some New Testament evidence. I want to call your attention, first of all, to a third book called uh, Prophecy, A Gift for Today by Graham Houston, a British uh, pastor, teacher. I found it uh, a little more accessible than Wayne's book. Wayne's a good friend of mine, and this is a very thick and daunting book. This was his doctoral dissertation at the University of Cambridge. He has lightened it up a little bit, but it's still pretty heavy sledding. And uh, Graham Houston's is about a third as long and s- argues for the same point. So, Prophecy of Gift for Today by Graham Houston. And here's some arguments that I think bring me on to the view that prophecy is a non-authoritative, fallible, human report or expression with the mouth of something we sense God has brought to our mind for people's good, their edification, their consolation, their encouragement which is to be tested by the renewed mind of verse 2. The church is not led by prophets. The church is led by elders who govern prophets and keep them under control because they tend to go crazy, which I'll give you some illustrations of before we're done. It's a very valuable and a very dangerous gift, as most gifts are. Evidence number one. Let's just look at some text. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. I may move through these a little more quickly than you have time to look them up, but you sure can try. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. This is Pentecost. The event is being explained by Peter as a fulfillment of the prophet Joel, chapter 2, and this is what he says. And in the last days, quoting Joel, in the last days... It shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And he's saying that is an explanation of what's happening 2,000 years ago as the end of the age. In the last days, this will happen, like today, 2,000 years ago. So we live in the last days. We live in the last days. For 2,000 years, we've been living in the last days because the Messiah has come. And when the Messiah comes, the end comes. It just happens to overlap for a while. One day is as 1,000 years with the Lord. So... Here in these last days, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 to 4. Said to the church in Corinth, Pursue love, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding, encouragement, consolation. That's a good definition of prophecy. Speaking to people for their encouragement, their consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. The one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, that sounds a lot like prophecy is not a select group of authoritative spokesmen who, along with the apostles, provide the foundation of the church. That sounds like, come on, Corinthians, come on, you Corinthians, desire this, all of you. 1 Corinthians 14, 29, add a very important component to the gift Let two or three prophets speak. He's trying to govern this out-of-control service at Corinth. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, 
Let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. If you're out of control, you got to shut up. The spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. Now, here are two crucial things come out. One is prophecy appears to be based on a revelation. If a revelation is made to another sitting by, let the first be silent, which is why I said it's a human report of something God brought to mind. It's not an exposition of Scripture. That's called teaching, which is also listed in this list of gifts. The other thing here, verse 29, and this is amazing, it says, let the others weigh what is said. Hmm. Weigh. Let them weigh what is said. Now, that's very different from saying, well, you may have a true prophet here and a false prophet here, and Jesus said, by your fruits you will recognize them, false prophet in sheep's clothing. That is not what's going on here. This doesn't say look at the person's life. It says weigh what this person says. And that word weigh is, you look up all those uses in the New Testament, you get something like, listen to this with a little bit of skepticism and try to decide how much of it you think is of God. That's what it means. The Scriptures are inspired and inerrant, and infallible, and bottom line decisive in the life of the church. Those who claim to speak with ideas brought to their minds by God are not authoritative, they are not infallible, and they are not bottom line decisive in your life, in deciding what you should do with your life or anything else. They are commending to you what they believe to be of God, which, if it is of God, very likely the Holy Spirit will deeply and powerfully confirm in your life that it is of God. The apostles spoke with authority, not the prophets. Listen to the end of that paragraph, chapter 14, verse 37 and 38. Paul says, if anyone thinks he's a prophet, or spiritual, he should acknowledge the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he's not recognized. In other words, you put the prophets in their place and you elevate apostolic teaching to its proper place. That's the order, which, which helps us because there's a lot of nervousness around this idea that if you've got people going around speaking for God, you're in chaos. And you may be if you get things out of order and out of proportion. 1 Thessalonians 5.20 points us in the same direction where it says, do not despise prophecies, which is a very interesting phrase. I don't think he would have worded it like that had not we been tempted to do so, which I am tempted to do so, and I'll give you some awful reasons why I'm tempted to do so in a few minutes. I have had some horrible experiences. And yet Paul says, in spite of the horrible experiences he probably had and you had, don't despise this gift. And then he adds, but test everything, hold fast to what is good. And I don't think he's saying there, check out this person. If it's a false prophecy, get that person out of the way because true prophets only say what's true. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, here comes a person. They are telling you that they believe God has led them to say this, and you should check it out and receive 50, 60, 70, 20 percent of it, and not the rest. That's what test all things, hold fast to the good means. It's the same with preaching. I do believe God is leading me in my preaching. I just happen to base it all, I hope, on texts. But I expect you to assess, test all things, hold fast to what is good. 
So if I were to say, it's not in the text, but I just sense God wants us to build a $10 million sanctuary here, you should just check that out. And probably say, he lost a gear. 1 Corinthians 13 is very significant. It's the love chapter. And from verses 8 to 10, something is said which is very relevant to whether or not the gift of prophecy is valid today in the 21st century. It says, verse 8, 1 Corinthians 13, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, probably meaning the gift of knowledge, the word of knowledge, it will pass away. For now we know in part, and we prophesy in part. In other words, imperfectly, right? Imperfectly. Test all things. Hold fast to the part that is right. We prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Now, when is that? And it's real clear when that is in verse 12. Now I know in part... Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. That is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. The arrival of the perfect is the end of the age with the banishing of all sin and all fallibility, and we will no longer make mistakes we will know fully as we have been fully known. That's the second coming, which means this gift is valid till the second coming. Which means it's valid today. Back to chapter 14, verse 1, 1 Corinthians. Pursue love, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. I don't think that would make sense if Gaffin were right, namely that prophecy is the prerogative of a small and authoritative scripture writing level inerrant group of men who listed, existed for a little while and then ceased because this just looks to me like Paul is saying Pursue love, everybody. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts, everybody, especially everybody that you may prophesy. Everybody in this room should obey that command. You should go home tonight and ask for spiritual gifts, whatever God wants to give you, empower you, so that when you have a small group meeting, there are mighty, powerful gifts flowing back and forth for each other. And you build each other up in the faith with gifts. Shouldn't be afraid of these things. So, I'm persuaded for those reasons that prophecy is valid and it has this meaning. Let me put a, try, to, try to put a uh, definition on it. Something like this. Um, a spirit-guided expression of something we otherwise would not know or say, which is powerful for the particular moment in which it's spoken to bring conviction, exhortation, consolation, awakening, upbuilding of faith. It's not infallible any more than my teaching, which I believe to be spirit-guided, is infallible. Now, I have a really, really high regard for Richard Gaffin. And let me give you the two main reasons he disagrees with this view so that you can have a balanced understanding. I think these would be the two main. At least they're the two main reasons that other friends of mine don't embrace this view. Number one, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, you get a list of the spiritual gifts, and the order is perplexing. For me, it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, 
God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kinds of tongues. The order there is odd, if I'm right, because it, it says you got the apostolic authority, then you got prophecy, then you got teaching, and, and you've just said that the church is governed by elders who have the gift to teach, and the prophets have to be subordinate to them. How come they're stuck in second? Between apostles and teachers, like they're somehow more important or more authoritative or... What do you make of that, Piper? And here's my answer. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know what to make of it. I just don't think word order without an explanation in the Bible can overthrow all the text that I just read to you. I don't know. If you find out, tell me. Here's the second reason. This is why I, I'm very respectful of those who disagree. That's a, that's a pretty good argument. Here's the second one. Ephesians 2.20. This is another one that Gaffin would surely bring forward. It says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ himself being the cornerstone. Now, that does not refer to Old Testament prophets. We know that because just a few verses later, in chapter 3, verse 5, it says, The mystery of Christ was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. These are prophets alive in Paul's day. So apostles and prophets in chapter 2, verse 20 of Ephesians, and 3, 5 are prophets in Paul's day. And it says the church is built on the apostles and prophets. So, Piper, you think everybody is supposed to have this gift or pursue this gift, and lots of people can have it then and now? What kind of a foundation is that? A foundation is a once-for-all thing, like the, the apostles, they wrote their, their books. Their, it's finished. The canon is closed. It's in this book. We stand on this book. Amen. That's where I am. So, prophets must be like apostles in their authority because the church is standing on them. So this, this idea of a loosey-goosey gift like you just described that goes on from generation to generation, mm -mm, that won't work. And that's the second major argument against my view. I'll give you a possible explanation, a possible answer to that one. I just ask you to consider this, that the term apostles and prophets may be one group of people, not two. That is, apostles who are prophets, like Noel is a wife and mother. That's not two Noels, right? Wife and mother. That's one Noel, two functions, wife and mother. Apostles and prophets, one group of men, two functions. The contextual pointer that Paul thinks that way is uh, chapter 4, verse 11, where he says he has given some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the structure, everybody agrees. Every, every commentator I know agrees that pastors and teachers, there's one group of people, not two. They're not some pastors and some teachers, but pastors and teachers are one group of people. So at least it's possible, just possible, I won't press it any further than that, that apostles and prophets means the apostles who function as prophets. And that's the foundation of this book. The apostolic word is there. It was prophetic. It was apostolic. Boom, we stand on it. That's what we base everything on. But you can see that the other side has a couple of pretty strong arguments, maybe more. And therefore, my goal then is not to say, we've got to have a church where everybody agrees on this, because I know that's not the case, not in this room and not in, the wider, not in the wider church, that everybody believes in this church that the experience that I'm describing, God brings something to mind, I report it, it stuns because it lands on somebody with unusual spiritual force and convicts of sin, 
they just say, that happens, just don't call that prophecy. That's not New Testament prophecy. If a person holds that view, okay, we can live together just fine. Use another name, use another name, and that will be okay. Just know that that's all I mean by the New Testament gift of prophecy. I don't mean anything more authoritative than that. So let me try to be practical now, and let's just say, okay, if we can agree that the experience is valid, and tolerate Piper's calling it prophecy, or Grudem, or Houston, or lots of other pe- people, uh, how should we use it? What, what should we do with it? And I'm going to close with three suggestions, and I'm going to go back to, to verse 6 and pick up the little phrase, uh, if prophecy, use it according to the proportion of your faith. What does that mean? According to the proportion of your faith, and I got three suggestions for us as a church. Number one, using this gift in proportion to our faith means using it to exalt Jesus Christ. Practically, what that means for me is that as I'm sitting here during the last song or during the text that Mike read, I'm praying, and I'm praying something like this. A whole, I do aptat, you don't need to know what that is, but the P of aptat, A-P-T-A-T, is pray, and it's, Lord, grant me brokenhearted humility before your word. Grant me boldness. Grant me love. Grant me accuracy. Grant me faithfulness. Grant me clarity. Grant me converting power. Grant me the gift of prophecy. And when I say that, I mean, Lord, while I'm preaching, apart from my notes, put in my head things that when they come out of my mouth will penetrate through very hard hearts, stun some people, awaken some people, humble some people, encourage some people, reconcile some people in ways that in that moment and that time has an unusual effect, an unusual power because of its prophetic timeliness, unprepared by me and unpre-thought. That's not a belittling of my preparation. I work really hard on sermons. I intend to work hard on sermons till the day I die. All it is is saying, along with the gift of teaching, would you give me today the gift of prophecy? And I don't think you always have the same gift. When I say give me a gift of prophecy, I just mean tonight... Do one of those strange 36th floor things. If you please, he's sovereign. He gives whom he will what he wants. But my prayer is, give me what I need in order to magnify Christ the most. If if my faith is strong, then then any gift that comes will be used for Christ-exalting, not Piper-exalting or Bethlehem-exalting, but Christ exalting. So that's the first guideline. Make sure that as you ask the Lord, so here you are driving to your small group tomorrow night. What are you praying? Well, add to your prayers this now. Call it whatever you want, but add to your prayers, Lord, tonight would you grant me a gift of prophecy, a gift, not the gift, but a gift of prophecy for my group? I have no idea what that might mean, or what I might say in the conversation or the discussion. Just would you come and stir my mind in ways I haven't given any thought to necessarily, and may out of my mouth come something amazingly helpful, Christ-exalting. Get right through somebody's need. Oh, we've had experiences in praying for people in this church along those lines that have been stunning. I love to give you some more examples where we think we're praying for one thing. We pause. We wait for the Lord. We say, Lord, would you just bring to mind? I mean, if you're charismatic, you'd say, Lord, would you say, speak? I think that's a little, little, little less careful. But, Lord, would you just bring to mind because it, it, it leaves open testing. If, if you say, say, it sort of like cuts off testing. Like, how can you test God, you know? You don't test God. You test people and what they claim to be from God. So you, you say, Lord, would you bring to mind what may be really going on in this person? And then somebody says something, and whammo, this person's in tears because you, they were touched in a way that the, the original agenda wasn't about. 
That's number one, Christ exalting. Number two, using the gift in proportion to our faith means that we will use it humbly and boldly. Humbly and boldly. Humbly meaning you won't say, the Lord told me to tell you. You won't say that. You won't talk that way because of this whole biblical dimension of let all things be tested, hold fast to what is good. You won't put people into a compromised situation of having to question God. Don't talk that way. Rather say, I sense or I think that the Lord would have us or wants us or is leading us, and you say it tentatively, you offer it. And if it's of God, it comes with power. If it's not of God, it won't. You, you can't make it have power by some lofty tone of voice, the Lord's soul. You can't. God doesn't work that way. The still, small, powerful voice can break a cedar. So don't worry about Just offer it and let the group test. And by boldness, I mean don't be afraid to offer it. We're afraid. I think people think we're weird if we say something like, I think this afternoon as I was praying about our group, <coughs> the Lord wanted me to say, hmm, and then you commend it to the group as a possible need or challenge that the group has. Lastly, number three, using your gift in proportion to faith means that you will make love the measure of what you say. Make love. Faith works through love. Galatians 5, 6. Therefore, if you're acting your gift in faith, it will be loving. So you measure what you say with the criterion of love. An example, now in closing, how that did not happen in one particular case. We worked on these issues 10 years ago, 14 years ago now, 89 and 90. If you want to see my fuller statement, I think there are 10 messages on these things at the website under the banner, Compassion, Power, and the Kingdom of God, all in the first quarter of 1990. They're all on the line, on the website. You can see the fuller picture of what I have see it, said about these things. Well, in those days as we were trying to be honest and open to the Lord about these things, a, a woman comes to me, and I had heard she's going around making prophecies over people, and she says to me, my wife is pregnant with Barnabas. She wrote this out, read it to me. Your wife is going to give birth to a daughter, and she's going to die in childbirth. Now, I'm doing my best to be open to what God is saying in the church. And I cried in my study when she left. I cried. And never told Noel until she had Barnabas and didn't die. There she is, right there. So it was a false prophecy, but the main point is it was loveless. Well, what's the point of that? What can you do with a prophecy like that? You're going to have a daughter and your wife's going to die. I mean, that's not a helpful thing to say. True or not, it's not helpful. It's not loving. We don't need to go around making pronouncements over everybody's head about what the, we think their future is going to be like. Just keep that. That's not helpful. So let love govern this, which means we should probably close now with this central three verses from 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of of men or of angels, but have not love. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Though I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have faith so as to remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. 
Therefore, Bethlehem, let us take this precious, dangerous gift in hand and use it lovingly to build each other up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we've scratched the surface of some of your ways. We can't begin to articulate how the, the supernatural intersects with the natural. We don't know that. We don't have categories or words to explain how something can be prompted by you and come so muddled out of our mouths. But thank you for telling us it does and that we're to test all things and hold fast to what is good and make us good at both the speaking and the testing here at Bethlehem. I pray in Jesus' name.